On 30th of June 2016, a statue commemorating Mary Seacole was unveiled outside St Thomas's Hospital in London. Mary was a nurse who had travelled to the Crimea in 1855. At the time, British, French, Sardinian and Ottoman soldiers were engaged against Russians in a war famous for its notoriously incompetent international butchery. In 1854, Florence Nightingale had gone to Crimea to improve and take charge of the conditions in which Allied soldiers were nursed. Mary had hoped to join the nurses working with Nightingale, but she was rebuffed. Instead, she made her own way to Crimea, where she stayed for just over a year, looking after injured soldiers and supplying provisions to Allied officers and men. There is a vigorous debate centred on the value of her contribution to the welfare of the soldiers, which often takes a rather pointless form of, was Mary Seacole as important as Florence Nightingale? I am no expert in 19th century nursing, so I have nothing particular to add to this debate, only to say that both women worked hard in different ways to alleviate the awful conditions in which injured soldiers found themselves. There is too little evidence that they saw each other as rivals. They seem rather to have been on quite friendly terms. What is clear is that during the course of her year in the Crimea, Mary's name became familiar to readers of British newspapers, as war correspondents praised her efforts. Upon her return to Britain, she fell into financial difficulties which plagued her until she died in 1881. But she remained popular in London. Her entertaining autobiography sold well. She moved in very prestigious circles, and famous patrons such as the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Wellington supported a fund successfully established to alleviate her financial plight. After her death, Mary Seacole slipped somewhat from the public consciousness, at least in Britain. For 100 years, little was written about her, and she was not celebrated in the way that, say, Florence Nightingale was. Since the rediscovery and reconsecration of her grave in 1973, and the centenary anniversary of her death in 1981, she has become increasingly well known, however. Pupils in English schools are taught about her life and achievements, there is now a Mary Seacole Memorial Association. She has been recognised with an English heritage blue plaque. She has appeared on stamps and buildings, institutions, prizes and leadership programmes have all been named in her honour. 2016 saw not only the unveiling of her statue, but also a Mary Seacole Google Doodle. Truly, global fame knows no greater expression. This story of Contemporary fame followed by a slide into historical oblivion before rediscovery and renewed interest is familiar. Fifty years ago, who, for example, was talking about Cardinal Newman, William Wallace or even Ragnar Lothbrook? What sharpens this issue in the case of Mary Seacole is, to a lesser extent her gender and to a greater extent her colour. Mary was born in Jamaica to a mixed-race mother and a white father. The degree to which Mary did not get the recognition she deserved on account of her colour is a question that has to be confronted. Why was she turned down when she originally applied to serve in the Crimea? At the time, doubts were expressed about the suitability and rigorousness of her nursing qualifications and experience, which had been gained in Jamaica and Panama. It would be naive to think that her race was not a factor, at least, in these suspicions. Certainly, Mary herself wondered if her duskier skin had led to the refusal of her offers to help. Whatever the debate today about her exact contribution to the war effort, the fact remains that there was, for 100 years, no debate at all, because she had been forgotten by the British public. Can we really argue again that her race played no part in this? After all, she was celebrated in Jamaica, and I don't remember learning about any black women in my history classes at my school in London. True, no one could argue that Mary is a forgotten figure today, and her colour has played a part in her recent fame. In 2004, for example, she topped a poll which asked those taking part to name the greatest black Britons. But the fact remains that Mary's statue is the first statue to commemorate a named black woman in Britain. That is, by any standard, an atrocious level of representation. To 
Today, there is a great deal of discussion about taking statues down. What I find especially interesting about Mary Seacole is that a 13-year campaign was fought to put one up. Not because I think it was undeserved, but because I wonder what it adds to our understanding of Mary's life. I cannot make windows into Mary's mind, but I would imagine that, as a nurse, she would have been more pleased with the prizes, hospital wards, buildings and nursing programmes named in her honour than she would a statue placed outside a bleak hospital building. 100 years before the installation of Mary's statue, a statue to Florence Nightingale was raised in London. Who, without using Google, can tell me where this is? Who has noticed it as they journey around London? Are statues the best way nowadays of honouring historic contributions to British society? Or do they instead tell us more about the people in the society that wants to put them up? Simply put, does Mary's statue tell us more about us than it does Mary? Mary?